Thrill Me. This show is part of the Thrill Me Podcast Network. Experience more on Facebook and YouTube. An ale for me. And for my officers... Welcome in to a new 10 Ford. I am your host, Zach. And on this special edition of 10 Ford, I know it's so soon for this series to have a special episode. We are not carrying on through our TNG watch along. What we are doing is a week ago, I went to cover GalaxyCon. I talked about it on the last two episodes, and I even went to the premiere of You Can Call Me Bill with William Shatner, and on this episode, I have been able to record some of the panels that were going on, so there is a panel with Terry Metalis, who is the showrunner of season three of Picard, which goes in with this, there is a panel with Brent Spiner, who plays Data, and there is a wild panel with William Shatner that I recorded. I also put in some footage from the red carpet and such like that, and I will get into all those things after the panel. So let's go to our first one, which will be Terry Metalis talking about Star Trek Season 3 of Picard podcast we're thrilled to have with us today once again we're sitting down one year later with the showrunner and executive producer of the great Star Trek Picard season three very important I say season three Terry Metalis you're in the sand with that exit from this Terry <laughs> did we start I, what was your first was your first convention in Richmond last year for Star Trek 3? For Star Trek no, Overcurse Season 3? It, it was Seattle. That was Seattle. Seattle. Oh, was, okay. Uh, or, yeah. So you oh, weren't here last year? No. I so, wasn't, was I here? I was on a video. Oh, no. oh no. that's right. I was, I was that thing? Yeah. yeah. No, I was in my office. Uh, right. I had too many drinks. drinks. Yeah, I remember that. That was right. You were right on the screen and we interviewed you. Oh, yeah, via yeah. remote, via So satellite. it is one year late. Well, it was a technical disaster, wasn't it? No, no. it was great. <laughs> it was, it was, no, it was a technical disaster at the beginning because they couldn't get you on screen. It was like Carol Marcus trying to communicate with right. regular <laughs> one. But <laughs> we, we, we couldn't, couldn't make it work. But then when once you were on, it was great. What's Carol Marcus from? Is that... Uh -huh. <laughs> but the thing that was interesting, I remember we talked to you before the show premiered. So we were like, avoiding like we were talking about what do you think of the star trek movies and what do you think of this and back to the future and like we were all these generic questions because you couldn't really talk about the show yet right right now you can now i can <laughs> yeah yes so let's talk a little bit about and then we'll open it to questions because we know you got a lot of questions for terry um but it, it's been a year since the show premiered what surprised you the most about the reception oh um Lots of exciting things. I think the reaction to Todd Stashwick as Captain Shaw, I think, was good. That was um, something. You know, he was on he was on my previous show, Twelve Monkeys. So we wrote that role specifically for him. But we knew that some, that, bless you, uh, <laughs> that some people are going to have an allergic reaction to anybody saying no to Patrick Stewart and Jonathan Frakes. And so, but we didn't know. Um, and so it was really nice to watch people kind of fall in love with Todd because we all love him too. I also thought, after I remember watching the first episode um, and thinking, I love this character, but I wonder if people are going to embrace him because you know he's so mean, not only to the people you love, but you know he, he, he you know and he's making all the right decisions for the right reasons, but you know he's saying no, famously a meme to everyone, and like are people not going to like that because they seem to embrace more the touchy feeling? Well, they said they didn't. They, they, they didn't. In fact, I think he, there was a line in that trailer where he said something like, uh, I think they did the bit, he's like, well, we won't be blowing things up. And 
There was like a whole like, oh, Star Trek is off the rails again. It's about <laughs> blowing things up. I'm like, it's the trailer. Um, the uh, yeah, but wait, Moriarty you know, was the great big bad of the season. <laughs> <laughs> I, know, I, know, I know, but there are people who have wanted that too. So it was. Um, I think, you know, it's um, it, it, when it when he, he he first came out and had that first scene. There was a lot of Twitter uh, tweeting, doing the Twitter thing, hating on it. But um, it was pretty quick. I think by the next episode, when you can understand that this guy is. He's just right. Like, that was the, the rule in the writer's room, is this guy can't be wrong about anything he's saying. He just doesn't have to be nice being right. But how um, great was it to follow the audience's turn? It wasn't great. Um, not on Twitter. Really? Not, not on Twitter. I, I it was, uh, Twitter was like a live studio audience. Mm. <laughs> and uh, with Star Trek, that is a room of people throwing things. It's a bar fight. It's <laughs> bottles. It's Jerry Springer. Yeah, so. Um, it's impossible to gauge popularity mm. because the loudest could be the negative, most negative, or, 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 or just not into what you're doing. Um, it really actually wasn't until uh, ratings and articles and reviews and, uh, and honestly coming here and meeting people and, and talking to them that I was like, oh, I think this is, and Kevin Feige and, and folks like that who were like really into it. So that was, um, that was probably when yeah, because we had this whole little sewing circle of friends. You saw business. it very early. We saw it very early, and there were only a few other people, but it was like all like people in the business, and we're all like, can you believe how good this is? And we'd ask each other, is this really as good as we think it is? It's like, yeah, it really is good. And it was like, we couldn't believe it. Yeah, well, I remember when uh, someone told me Mark Altman saw it, and I was like, Oh. <laughs> I remember Michael Pillar called me the Antichrist of Star Trek at one point, and, and I, he likes. Uh, but I, but I listened to this podcast, and um, and, and we famously disagree on Star Trek Three, which, and, and, uh, which is which is an excellent episode, which we should all listen to. Um, it's the gateway drug to the podcast. If you haven't it, listened to it before, yeah, was it was it last week or two weeks ago? Two weeks ago, yeah. yeah. Um, but uh, so I really. Did not think that you were gonna dig it, and then when I got that email from you, I was like, "Oh my god, we got Mark!" Terry, I will make an admission I have never made publicly before. I did not think I was going to like it. <laughs> no, I knew there's no <laughs> way that you got that thing, and we're saying, "Oh boy." Um, so I, uh, it was it was really nice to to, to hear your response, hear your response, well, and Ashley's response. And we talked about this before because you get Star Trek, and it's not that just you get it from watching it. You love Star Trek. You grew up loving Star Trek. And then, of course, you worked on Star Trek, and you saw everything they did right and wrong on Voyager and Enterprise as an intern, and then later as an assistant to Bradley Braga. You know, how much do you think your approach to Picard was forged by that experience? Oh, wow. Um, it, it would be impossible to say none of it, you know? sit there. I just never thought I would ever have the opportunity, but I remember um, when Enterprise, I was there when Enterprise premiered, and they were putting it together, and the, um, they were putting together the opening credit sequence, which they, I think, um, to their, I think there should be kudos for them trying to do something different. And when they cut it, it was to U2's Beautiful Day. Right. And it was awesome. It really like worked. You're like this. It does feel different, and it does feel elevated. And then there were Paramount's like, well, we don't own you that. We need a song that we can we can own. And then that other song came out. And I remember going, this is a, this is not the right way to do this. You did not have to. And, 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 right. And and I, I said to Brandon, and he he was like, uh, no, I think it's going to be good. I think it's going to be good. Um, so you take things like that, those lessons of. Because I can see the doubt in his eyes, you know. And it's like that. I and, saw fear and, in the Klingons. Uh, you, you, can, you, can, you can see it. And um, I will say that when I, uh, when there's a voice in the back of my head or uh, that says you should say something, I will now listen to that more. Um, there's a there's a, a, a thing on set. Where, like, how do you know if a take is good or how do you know if like a cut of an episode is good? And it's like it's not here. It's like it's here. It's a feeling, but you have to be 
sensitive to it, and you may not know what it is that's wrong, but you have to say, all right, hold on, hold on, hold on. Something's wrong. Something's wrong. And you don't have any time. If you're on set, you have no time. You've got like five minutes to figure out what is wrong before you have to move on with your day. So I would say that I'm probably more, having grown up with that, more sensitive to that voice and listening to it. Well, I think we both, and Ashley too, were in the showrunner's training program, and what is the one thing we teach the, you? Really? Yeah. Where's Ashley? Where's Ashley? Yeah, he, he, he's, he got a better offer. Oh, I see. So, got it. Um, <laughs> the one, he's at WonderCon. <laughs> he, so the one thing they teach you above all else is the worst decision you can make is no decision. Yes. Yes. And then you have to be able to make a decision, yeah. right or wrong, but not to sort of like, uh, don't fun for Yeah, it's, it's true. Um, it's, sometimes it's terrifying. Um, the one, the, the moment that, that I almost had to do that was, in season three was Ed Spilliers. There was a problem getting him over for the visa, and he was the only guy we really loved to play Picard's son. Because the second, the second we even introduced the idea of, of the son of Jean-Luc Picard, you have to have somebody who can stand up on his own uh, against Patrick Stewart and feel like it came from the DNA of Beverly Crusher and, 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 and Jean-Luc Picard. That's what they said about Tom Hardy. Right, right. <laughs> yeah, no, but Tom's uh, like an excellent actor. I mean, like, of course. there is all, you know, like great. Just, uh, whether or not you enjoy that movie or not. Um, so uh, the visa was was not, it did, there was problems, I forget, was something going on in Syria, and it was holding up everything, and they're like, we're not gonna make it on time, you have to pick another choice, and we, I had to. And I was holding on to the last minute, and fortunately, that guy just dragged his feet, and then at the last second, I got a text, I woke up to a text from Ed, he's like, my visa came through, my visa came through, I'm on a plane, I'm on a plane, and I was like, oh my God, thank God, because I don't think it would've worked. I really don't think it would've worked without Ed. And sometimes things just go right, and then by the grace of God, because imagine that guy's deal had closed sooner, and then Ed was available. Yeah, yeah, that's that's wild. And of course, Ed is so great in the show, yeah. and that's the, that's a hard role.
before anyone gets into the building. <laughs> you have to uh, respond as four, each of you. All right. Uh, here we go. What is that? Uh, well, that's yours. Yeah, this way, this way. Oh, I, I thought you had a gift for me. Well, well you, you know I like to give away the sweets. Well, I do. Uh, what happened to your hair? I, it's a new deal. It's it, it just, you know, it's, 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 yeah. it, you know, it's, 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 well, it's my, uh, it's my ode to Jack Lord. It's a very well-crafted <laughs> comb over. You, you know, are, I've got about three more years left on it, then i got to start shaving it. Yeah. Well, you are extremely trendy, and that impresses me, but, but, don't you think green, maybe? The top should be green. Then I would draw focus away from our guests, and then everybody would look at like the green. Nah, I can't do it. No way. I'll wear, I'll wear, uh, I'm wearing green laces for St. Patty's Day tomorrow. Oh, very nice. So. And your name is Patty. That's, yes. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Hi, everybody. Are you, <laughs> are you awake yet? I'm not. <laughs> uh, well, yeah. let, let's do let's do this. Yeah. Um, we were, we were bouncing around, and then last year, of course, during the SAG strike, couldn't talk about anything. But um, yeah. I thought we'd talk about Picard for a little bit, because I don't think we've had a little one-on-one -on -one about it. About, if you uh, wish. I, can we not? Can, let's talk about uh, uh, Penny Dreadful City of Angels. <laughs> sure. <laughs> sure. How did, Penny Dreadful, how did Penny Dreadful City of Angels start for you? I was given this part. I was given the part. I didn't even have to audition for it. How many people saw that show? <laughs> one. <laughs> one. <laughs> a few. Actually, it's a really good show. Yes, uh, it, is. it was, uh, I don't know if you saw the original Penny Dreadful, which was a really good show. Uh, and then they did a sequel to it called, uh, uh, what was it called? Uh, City of Angels. Uh, anyway, it was a really, I played the, a police uh, lieutenant, if you can believe that. <laughs> I, I didn't believe it, really. Anyway, go ahead. Uh, well, Keep over there. Want to talk about Picard? Want to talk about uh, yeah? Tell me so. Okay. Well, let's, uh, all right. Well, um, when did you um, when did you get the overture uh, to come on back for the first season? Because I think it was kind of like Pat was doing his thing, and I think you guys were. Have you gotten a call? No. Have you? Have you? Well, kind of. I mean, we we didn't. None of us expected to be on the show uh, on Picard originally, and I'm not talking third season. I'm talking about from the get go, season one. Uh, we were at a convention in Las Vegas, and Patrick came out on stage and announced that he was coming back. <laughs> I shall return. <laughs> As one of your famous generals once said, <laughs> I think it was, Matheith? <laughs> no, I don't remember. Uh, anyway, uh, he, uh, yeah, he announced that, that he was going to be doing this series, Picard. So, well, it, it wasn't called Star Trek Picard at that time. They didn't know what it was going to be called. Uh, they knew it was going to be a new Star Trek series that starred Patrick Stewart as Jean-Luc Picard. And um, that's what he announced, and, and everybody was excited. And we were all like, what? There's a new Star Trek? And so he invited us all to dinner that night. And uh, he took us all out to dinner, which was really nice, all the Next Generation cast. And uh, he said, now look, I'm going to do this show, and none of you are in it. <laughs> Great. Uh, I'll have the steak. Uh, but, uh, uh, but, as it turned but you, out... But you're, uh, but you're a vegetarian vegan, so you just, well, you just ordered the most expensive thing on the menu. Exactly. I wasn't going to eat it, I just <laughs> ordered it. Uh, so, uh, they, uh, you know, anyway, Patrick kind of hinted to me that evening, though, that uh, it, it involved Data a little bit, in that it was about Picard later on, and he uh, had not quite gotten over the guilt of, of uh, losing data and, and the way that happened and how badly it did at the box office. And he was... Uh, <laughs> so he was a little upset about that still, but God was. And uh, <clears throat> so he said, you know, that's, you never know what could happen. So I got a phone call. Keep going. 
You know, when you want to drink water, Patty, I'll hold the mic for you. <laughs> it's okay. It's, I, I lost my damage to Mars. It's okay. All right. You know, it, it, can you believe the people who are missing this fantastic panel? <laughs> <laughs> I, I feel so badly for them. Oh, well, anyway. Uh, actually, I think I feel bad for them. I think saying feeling badly is incorrect grammar. You can't feel badly. You can only feel bad, right? Right? Yeah. Are you an English teacher? <laughs> there you go. You can only feel bad. And I feel bad. Uh, anyway, so uh, then I got a phone call from uh, Alex Kurtzman, and uh, I'll hold for applause. If you like, or not. Uh, and uh, and uh, Akiva Goldsman and uh, Michael Shabon, of all people. Michael Shabon? What is he doing? Michael Shabon, the greatest novelist in America today, is going to be writing and show running the Picard show. And I thought, oh my God. Keep it going, Academy Award winner? Yeah, keep it. Academy Award for a Beautiful Mind. Uh, and then I thought, I can't be in this. And uh, so they said, we'd like you to play Data. It's not a lot, just the beginning of the season and the end of the season. And uh, I said, well, how do I, how can I play Data? I mean, look at me. I don't, you know, I mean, I look at at least uh, three, four years older. <laughs> and, uh, so they said, uh, don't worry, we do CGI, it'll look great, uh, you know. We've, we've used it on other people. It looks fantastic. Uh, you know what that looked like. Anyway, I'm not even going to go into that. But um, but I remember first day on the set, I said, Patrick, what? Uh, have they come up with a title yet for this show? And he said, They have. I said, What is it? He said, Star Trek. Good come up. <laughs> Ready for our next guest. It's my absolute pleasure to introduce the stage. He is an actor, author, and astronaut. Please welcome back, Mr. William Shatner. Thank you so much. Yeah, you, 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 you guys are early, right? I'm sorry I'm late. It's a, it's a really rude, but there's so many people and so much traffic, so it took longer than I expected. Hello, everybody. So, where will I start? Uh, no, no, I, I really, it was a rhetorical question. <laughs> um, so I have a, what's called a frozen shoulder. I don't know how I got it, but it doesn't work as well as it was, and it takes time to heal, apparently. Although, I've gone everywhere. I've gotten to doctors, and we'll cut. And then the doctor, no, we're not going to cut, and uh, we'll manipulate. But... So, I found somebody who had a frozen choker, and they said, it takes you know, like two years. It starts, and, heal, and then it heals itself. So I've been going to all these doctors, and I've entered an area that I've never been before, which is the politics of medicine. It's unbelievable. Everybody's got a different opinion. So this expert says, no, you got a tendon there, we'll cut. Okay, we'll cut. And I, are you kidding? You can't cut? Oh, oh. So it's like it takes a, a, t a time. It could be a couple of years before it frees itself up. But what it's done has sensitized me once again to other people's pain. So I, I was so I got, got in a wheelchair to get from one point to another with a life of um, inability to move very well for the rest of from when he was born for his whole life. What am I complaining about? So it really has the gift if you look at it that way, that this pain in my shoulders has given me is being more sensitive to other people's pain, even further than pain, their needs. No, if you look at it as a gift, it doesn't hurt as much. Uh, that's, that's the message I bring you. 
So here we are. I, apparently, uh, because I do uh, several of these Comic Cons a year, uh, this is the interesting part: being in front of an audience and getting your questions and and talking to you. Um, and uh, do we have a microphone set up? There was a, is, is there over? Where are you pointing? So last night, is it is it over here and over here? No, just over here. Somebody say yes. Oh my God! It's like unlocking uh, a door, you know. Door and the water rushes through. Yes, over there. So last night, part of what I've been doing this weekend is um, I've made a film. It's a, a documentary about the most interesting subject I can think of. <laughs> so it's, it's about me. So the movie is about me. It's a, and some really wonderful people filmed it. And it's the reason why I said, yes, I'll do it with this company, because over the years, people have said, we'll make a documentary about your life. No, nah, I don't think so, because that sounded like the end of life. But Legion M is the name of the production company, uh, said we'd like to do it, and we'll do it under these circumstances, and Alexander Philippe was the director, renowned director, so I, I, I said, yes, we've made a documentary about me. So now, one aspect of making films is making the film. The other aspect is getting it out there so people will pay money to see it so that that money will come back to the people who provided money to make it. Um, so it's an important aspect to, to make the film but the other part of that is to promote the film so that people will go see it. Oh, it's a film about who? Shatner. But Shatner now has to publicize the film, but it's about me. So the dilemma is, because, you know, I'm the least interesting subject that I can think of. And the last thing I want to do is talk about me. I hate talking about me or looking at me. So I've not seen all the Star Treks of all those years ago that I was in. I've not seen any of the new Star Treks. In fact, I'll tell you a story. There's a young lady who's the lead in one of the new Star Treks. She's about early 20s. It never occurred to me that the captain of the starship could be a young lady. It's occurred to other people and, and very successful. So I'd been asked to come in front of an audience uh, on television to talk about, to just say hello, essentially come out on stage and say hello to a large crowd of, crowd of people. Uh, and they wrote a few words for me to say. And they were putting them on a, on a teleprompter, which is way back there. So I came to the theater and I said, what are you backstage? And I said, what am I saying? So the guy with the teleprompter runs the words in front of me. I'm running him. Okay, I said that. I said that. Okay, I'm good. And he says, when the teleprompter goes on, that's your cue to speak. And this young lady will go out on stage to the right. You go out on stage to the left. You meet in front. And uh, when the computer, when the teleprompter goes on, speak. I said, okay. So, Okay, you're on. And she goes that way, I go that way, meet in front, and, we, and there's applause, and then the teleprompter comes on. And I start to speak. Just not familiar, the words aren't familiar to me. Uh, but hey, you're standing in front of an audience, somebody's gotta say something. So I started to talk, and I thank you very much, and I began, and I had a career, and I guess I go to, and then I, oh yeah, I, I recognize those words. And then I say those words, and, I, and thank you, and, and thank you, and the applause, and the both go off. I had said what she was supposed to say. 
I had no idea she was part of Star Trek. I don't watch it. I don't see it. But the light went on, and I just, you can't, you know, you, you, there's that, frequently, there's this pause. <laughs> so you think it's startling for the audience. Like, oh, what's he doing? But imagine how startling it is for the performer to go, and nothing happens. You can take about a count of two, one, two, and then something has to happen. Well, when we got backstage, they said, you spoke her words. What? Who is she? She's a, she's a lead in Starker. She's a lead in Starker. And she's with her agent, and they're all going, both of them are going, <laughs> if Daggy's of looks could kill. So to this day, I don't know whether she knows it was a complete accident or whether this guy Shatner, who did this thing that he so many eons ago, took over my part. <laughs> I'm the lead in the Star Trek, and he's the old guy that so that's an anecdote about something. So last night, my film premiered here, and they wanted me to do a question and answer. So I said, well, I'll do a question and answer. So I didn't want it. I haven't seen the film. I haven't seen the film because put yourself in my place. The film is wonderful, so somebody says. So what are you supposed to say? I know, I'm wonderful. <laughs> How do you speak about a film with, unless you're uh, a, 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 you know, an egomaniac? Talk about yourself. Yes, I was wonderful in that film. Do you love the scene that I was in where I was, but what? So I haven't seen the film thinking maybe I can get away with ignorance. You know, I say, well, I haven't seen that. Did you like it? Yeah, I like it. Well, uh, I'm glad you liked it because I like it. I mean, I don't know what to do. I'm supposed to do publicity on a, on a film that, that I'm, uh, I'm everything in the film. There's nobody else. That girl is not in that film. <laughs> so, last night I went out for question and answers, and it's a little disorganized because <laughs> it was the microphone. For the audience, there was no light on the audience. Everybody was late. I mean, it was just anyway. It went on. The film went on, and I hope they liked it. Give me a question. <laughs> Welcome back. I hope you enjoyed all those panels. I had such a good time with each of them. Like Terry Metalis, I loved all the info he was giving about Star Trek Picard. Even. Uh, with the casting of Picard's son, because I agree with him. I think the casting that we got with Ed was perfect. I loved him and I would love to see more of Ed in the future for Star Trek. Then we got Brent Spiner, who I didn't realize just controlled the stage at cons. Obviously, he's been to plenty of comic conventions. He's been to Galaxy Con. He was just having a ball up there. And there were some great questions asked. I didn't record those. But if you want to check out any of these panels, go to Galaxy Con. They will link you to their YouTube to watch the full uh, panel. So pretty cool there. And then William Shatner. This man had no time for anybody. I mean, we're talking about frozen shoulders. We're talking about uh, God knows why he's giving advice to a kid up front. There's a guy asking a question and he won't have it. none of his stuff. Absolutely loved it. I think William Shatner was a delight. I got to meet William Shatner when I was a kid in 1996, 97. I won a Captain Kirk uh, lookalike contest and it was a very quick passerby. Um, but being able to go to the, you can call me build premiere, I was super excited for meeting him and asking some questions because when we got the email from galaxy con about how we were going to be able to go to the red carpet, ask some questions and stuff like that. I was excited. I was preparing questions for my head. And as you saw in the footage, it's just, you know, just a quick look at what the red carpet was like and there's a couple of things that came out of this. So when he showed up, 
um, about 15 minutes before the VIP guests had their uh, pictures taken with them. I thought GalaxyCon handled this situation completely well. Like, it was, it, it felt like a movie premiere because, like, all the VIP guests, and what I'm saying here is that GalaxyCon had VIP tickets where you get to walk the red carpet, you get to go into the theater, and you uh, get a picture with William once he's set up, and then you watch the movie, and then there's a Q&A at the end. Unfortunately, I didn't stay for that Q&A because I knew I was going to do this panel. And then it got so late after seeing the movie and we were two hours away, I had to get home. We had things in the morning, yada, yada, yada. That doesn't matter. But what matters was the red carpet, once he got up there, we were told previously that there's a good chance that he wasn't going to answer questions, which I completely understand. But what was funny is that there were some people that got to ask questions some of them kind of what I was going to go for, like, what is it like watching a movie about your life, your career, uh, how much you mean to people and stuff. And he was shutting that shit down. Like, he wasn't having it. He was like, I haven't even seen the movie. Like, he made the movie. He didn't see it, which I know. I know a lot of actors are like, I don't want to watch myself. I can completely understand that. But he won't He won't have in any of these questions. And if you fumbled words or whatever, he'd be on you. He'd be like, oh, blah, blah, blah. What do you want? What do you want from me? You want me to get it? Very funny. Very controlling. Very, like, good times. But... I, at that point, Brooke looked at me and she was like, so what are you going to ask him? And I said, I'm ah, not a goddamn thing. I'm going to say congratulations on your movie. And when he got up to me, that's what I told him because he, we were right at the like entrance. He already asked or got asked three or four questions, shut them all down. And they got to us. I won't have it. And so I just, he told me, thank you. And he walked in. The thing about it though <laughs> And what was kind of infuriating, our mic didn't work. That's why it's also like a montage of footage because the the mics that we had, for some reason, shut the sound off. Don't know why, but all good. I was able to speak to him. It is what it is. Now, here's my um, review of You Can Call Me Bill. It's a documentary of William Shatner. Um, this is brought to you by Legion, and Legion was a, like... Not a crowdfunding, like you own a part of, you are a producer of the movie. It's not necessarily like a Kickstarter. It's a natural production company and you own part of the movie, part of the production. And the movie is done in a documentary style I've never seen before for a documentary. Like recently I watched, um, in the last year, I watched uh, Michael J. Fox's one still. And like it has interviews with co-stars, all these people around him, family members, and it's just going through his career, big timelines about him till he got Parkinson's. This movie was for You Can Call Me Bill is literally like a one man show and just telling you about his life's once you know, being a, a grandfather, like he's really embraced the grandfather style. He's he's kind of in this place where he loves, you know, his horses and dogs. You get a little bit of his early age, which he had a pretty rough upbringing from what it sounds like. And I think with that mind all the way through Hollywood, is what's really kind of shaped the man that we see. And watching, you know, his stuff from T.J. Hooker to Star Trek, um, Twilight Zone, we got clips from the movies like Airplane 2 and stuff. Like, the, he's had such a broad career that he just seems a little more normal than you would expect from the Hollywood type. I do feel he does like to do the red carpets. He loves, you know, the accolades he gets from people and from winning awards. But there is this part of him where you could tell he likes his farms. He likes his, he, he says it in the movie at the beginning, like this tree he wants to be a tree, like when he dies, like just bury him with the tree, he's gonna be a big old oak. Uh, and that just screams where William Shatner is in life now. Um, I think it's a good watch. I definitely, it's 90 minutes long. It's, it's not a hard watch whatsoever. If you are very interested in the William Shatner life and how he kinda, you know, looks and views at 
things now. I think it's a terrific you, you watch. You get footage from all these westerns he's been in, all the horror stuff. Like you get to see William Shatner in this one man documentary. And I find that fascinating. Like I said, the fact that it is just him talking his life, it's not like a bunch of people telling you what they remember of him. And that's very, that's very key because one of my questions going into it was, because I knew nothing of the movie, I was going to ask like, when people came up, what, what, what is it like with William Shatner? What are your memories? Do you, you know, who says what about you in the movie? I would have looked like a dumbass when he came up to me and he's like, I'm the only guy in the movie. Yep, dodged one. Yes. You didn't get me, Bill. You didn't get me. He said I could call him Bill. It says it in the movie. But Galaxy Con had a fantastic time. They're coming back every year. There's even Nightmare Weekend, which is like an offshoot of Galaxy Con I plan to go to. And they go everywhere. Like they're in Raleigh, North Carolina and other places like if you can search GalaxyCon, I would, and you can, like, right here, it's just GalaxyCon. Search it. This was the dates that I had, but anywho. Um, I had a fantastic time. My Trek heart was happy. I have this new Trek hat. I love my Trek hat. Um, it was just a blast. I had a great time at GalaxyCon, and I cannot uh, express you should try to go if you can. It is full it is packed when we did nightmare weekend it was just a blooming thing this is like year three or four for galaxy con and you can tell it's just growing and growing and growing so get your weekend tickets pre-buy your tickets immediately i highly suggest that if you plan on going i know brooke and myself are doing a patreon exclusive galaxy con talk so if you want to check that out check out throw me podcast networks patreon we will be doing that episode soon and next week we are back on it baby we're back in 10 forward we're gonna have biz we're gonna talk tng third episode well i guess technically third episode but fourth if you remember how i was talking anyways it's a thing thank you for having me galaxy con thank you to all the people that i got to i talked to anthony michael hall amazing guy amazing guy all right i'm getting out of here